This is TJ Almodovar, real estate advisor with McDonald Realty. Today, I'm going to be interviewing two experts in the rental property market. First, we have property manager David K. Wong with McDonald Commercial. So David, tell us which areas do you service and what kind of properties do you manage? It is, yes, I, I focus mainly in Vancouver and Burnaby, but also um, do have rentals in Richmond all the way up to uh, Langley. And Brian Saul with Real Property Management. Tell us which areas you service and what kind of properties you manage. Hi, guys. Um, I take care of basically anywhere from Vernon down to Astoria. So uh, we take care of all sorts of properties from commercial to uh, short term rentals to long term rentals or off season rentals. Got it. So David K. Wong with McDonald Commercial. You're servicing Greater Vancouver. Brian services uh, basically the Okanagan and you do long-term and short-term rental. So right. we'll start off with David. What are you experiencing out there in the rental market? Well, the market's starting to pick up obviously uh, with uh, COVID being under control. I think um, people are starting to move again. Um, in the early days we were talking about last year, we had obviously some significant uh, downturns in the market in terms of rent prices. People are moving out the core. Uh, that's stabilized and we're seeing uh, people starting to come back into the core, but it's not uh, an urban rush, but it's just we're starting to see things um, becoming more lively. All right. And Brian, what are you experiencing out there in um, the Okanagan? We are absolutely booming out here. Um, COVID didn't slow us down whatsoever. Uh, if anything, we just got progressively busier and busier and our the inventory basically for rentals um, has gone way down because what we're finding now is basically all the, the higher end houses and whatnot. Um, the, the owners are looking to sell it because it's a prime market for them. Um, and so those owners are now turning into renters. So now the competition has, it's just basically flooded the market and the inventory is way down. Is there, are there any other reasons why you're seeing more influx of renters and also why inventory is down? Inventory is down strictly for the fact of, you know, um, like I said, the, the owners are, are looking to, to cash out. Um, and Kelowna is not the little town it used to be anymore where, you know, you're getting away from traffic and uh, traffic is just starting to get worse and worse, to be quite honest with you. I moved up here 20 years ago and it, it's, it's night and day difference now from what it was 20 years ago. So, David, last year we spoke, uh, you know, right at the beginning of COVID, you mentioned rental rates drop as much as 20% in the downtown core. Has it recovered? And what are you experiencing with that? It's uh, stabilized. We haven't seen it recover back to its uh, original peaks. And so we're hopefully we're optimistic that as, as time progresses, where we are now starting to see um, uh, strengthening in pricing. Obviously, it's going to be very dependent on the quality of the product. So the better the product, we can maintain the pricing and also even ask for a little bit more. And so far, that's been the, the, what we're seeing. It, it's starting to work. Got it. And Brian, it seems that COVID has affected the Okanagan rental market a little bit differently than here locally in uh, Greater Vancouver. Uh, can you tell us uh, what the effects of COVID have been like there? It's definitely increased our rental rates here. Um, and, and inventory, like put it this way, inventory on single family houses, Literally, there's, there's under 15 single family dwellings available for rent right now. So that property that was $3,000 last year has gone up to like four to $4,500. It's gone up significant, significantly uh, in the single family dwelling market. Um, with one and two bedroom apartments, it's gone up, you know, literally 10 to 20% sort of thing. So is it realistic? No, um, I, I think, you know, the market's going to settle down within a year and get back down to reality. Um, but right now, you know, some, some owners want to take advantage of that numbers. I'm, I'm one of those property managers says, you know, let's not get the full pop right now. Cause you don't want that turnover of somebody, uh, jumping out of your property a year down the road. So, you know, I, I ask owners not to be greedy about it, but be fair. Um, I think it's just a better, better plan personally. So it, it, each owner has their different, uh, you know, way of looking at it, but. No, oh, that's incredible. That's like a 50% increase in single family rentals. Yeah, it's crazy. Wow. And is that uh, mostly for, are most of the dwellings there, is it typically a full home that's being rented or is it kind of uh, chopped up into an upstairs suite and a downstairs suite? The, the majority of it um, are, sing, are single whole family homes. Um, you obviously get a lot of those three bedroom up, two bedroom down scenarios. Um, and, you know, it, if you're managing it yourself, that makes it super difficult because there's that, that's always the property manager's biggest issues is, is when you have somebody above the other, um, constant phone calls and bickering between the two. So 
Um, I definitely suggest you go professionally if you're going to go that route. Um, if you're looking to, you know, just manage the property yourself, stick to the one family per home kind of thing. Or, you know, if it's an in-law or something, then it doesn't become your problem. So if I could recommend that, that's how I'd go. That's a good tip. And one thing that we've noticed, obviously, due to COVID, British Columbians can't really travel too far away. They can't really travel internationally. And, you know, I've noticed that the Airbnb market there, because I just booked an Airbnb in Kelowna, and we're paying about 600 something a night for a two bedroom um, near the downtown core there. And do you think the Airbnb rates are going to stabilize a little bit more once things open up? Uh, again, sorry, but there was no lack of traffic coming into Kelowna. Again, um, people, even if there was restrictions, they were still coming. Um, you know, they weren't crossing, we weren't getting the Albertans we get, and obviously we weren't getting the people from Washington state, which we get a ton of, um, off season and, and summer season here. Um, so yeah, it, it's going to stabilize you know, the rates at $600 a night again for a two bedroom place, maybe a little unrealistic. I mean, if you're filling in gaps between a five night stay, uh, from the first to the fifth, and then you have a gap for two days before the next five day stay, that's when you're getting those kind of prices up to the $600 mark. Otherwise, average yourself, you know, anywhere from three to $500. Again, if, you, if you're on the 27th floor and have a lake view, you can get a premium for it. But in reality, you're around that three to $500 a night mark. Got it. And I guess if you are an investor, you must be conservative with your numbers. So that makes sense. Yeah. And, but like, uh, again, I, I would always tell investors, you know, budget yourself 20 days per month in the summer. Right now you can, you can count on, you know, 25 to 28 days of the month. So it's, it's, it's gone up substantially that way as well. All right. So now we'll switch over to demand. Brian, I'll start with you first out in the Okanagan. You kind of mentioned what's highest in demand, which was single family homes for rental. I'll skip that question with you, but what is the hardest product you're seeing uh, to place a tenant in your market? Yeah, for, for us, it's not necessarily the product, but necessarily the location, because everything's everything's renting right now. So again, if you look into Kelowna, we have certain areas, um, I don't know if I should even mention, but you know, say say like a Rutland area, which is, is, is an older, older area, people, it has that stigmatism of like the old Surrey days, out in Vancouver, where it's considered, you know, lower, lower income level area. But I mean, I mean, again, like Surrey, it's starting to build up. There's plenty of newer homes, plenty of good areas in that area. Um, so just, just be wary of where you're investing in. Um, another area issue we're having is up in the, the uh, university district, UBC university district uh, by the airport. That part was, that place was booming uh, a year or two ago. And because of COVID, it basically um, limited the number of students that are now renting there because everyone can work uh, and do schooling from home. So just little, little scenarios like that you have to be cautious of. Got it. And now with you, David, what are you experiencing in Greater Vancouver? What type of property is most in demand? And what's the hardest product to place a tenant in? Similar to, uh, I guess, Brian, what he's saying in single families, it's still a uh, very uh, high demand because people who actually sold are displacing renters uh, or the seller is now looking to rent to transition between buying or building a new place. So that's increased. Now, the, the question is, is the quality of the available uh, single family homes. They, they're a wide variety so far. What I'm seeing is that a lot of people are very picky. They don't want to share. Uh, exactly what Brian was saying, uh, you know, you have a downstairs tenant that doesn't get along with the upstairs, people don't want that, and a lot of families have kids, and so they want to cohabitate in a peaceful location near good catchments and, and shopping and all that stuff, but right now there's not a lot of indiv just individual uh, type of properties that you can just rent alone, so they're always going to be split up, so that's going to be the challenge. Okay, and we, we're just speaking about demand, but next thing is because we probably have a lot of investors that are watching right now and uh, are, are taking a look at this video. Where are you seeing positive cash flow opportunities in your market? Let's start with you, David. Well, unfortunately, I don't have very many, if any, uh, unless you bought a long time ago and you're now cash flowing. Got it. Yeah, it's uh, the price points here in the Greater Vancouver are pretty high. How about you, Brian? Yeah, I, I don't know if I can really help you on that because I don't really see the numbers that the owners, you know, what, what they pay. We don't ever get that kind of information, but um, I, I'm a part of a RAIN member, Real Estate Investment Network member myself. And, you know, I, I always under the understanding that basically if you cash flow to $100, you're laughing. Um, 
So I, I, I don't know if I can give you an educated guess on you know where we're at here in Kelowna, but obviously it's far more feasible than it would be in Vancouver for sure. You know, because the influx of people coming here are basically from Vancouver and Alberta and who are cashing out and basically coming in here with a million dollars in their pocket sort of thing. So um, I don't think if we're really, we can't really compare ourselves. So we were just talking about cash flow opportunities. And one way to kind of increase your cash flow is by going into the short term rental market like Airbnb or VRBO. Can you give us more detail of how that's performing in your market? Let's start with you, Brian. Well, again, in Kelowna, short-term rentals, it's, it's a no-brainer. Um, and we've been strong throughout the COVID times, uh, even stronger right now. Uh, I've never had any issues with, with uh, Airbnb as far as um, profitability goes with the owners. Uh, I highly recommend it. Um, you just have to be aware of where you're investing. Um, issues uh, right now are with city council. They're, they're, they're very strict on where they're allowing it. So just, you know, make sure your realtor uh, is educated on that end of things before you invest because nothing worse than in buying a property and then you think you can Airbnb and you can't. Um, a lot of some of these towers, you, you were grandfathered in two years ago to, to Airbnb and then the new owners are not allowed to. So just always be cautious of that. Um, the other issue would be, uh, if be open to native land, um, a lot of people that scares them when they say native land, but they're they're more liberal with the, their regulations and rules on allowing Airbnb. So it, it, it ends up turning into a good investment as far as your ROI goes, because obviously it's typically a cheaper lot to, to you know to to own, um, and you're getting the same amount of Airbnb dollars. So uh, always look into that end of things. Great, a lot of great tips for Airbnb investors out there. Um, David, what can you say about Airbnb rentals in greater Vancouver? Uh, not very much. We just don't do them uh, on our side of the world just because uh, we're regulated. Um, Airbnb is a independent type of uh, operation. You're almost like in, acting like a host, uh, hostel or uh, air, a hotel. So the owners can do what they want. But now with all the strict bylaws and the stratas that are preventing it, it uh, we've seen from the COVID situation, and the exodus of Airbnbs just because of the lack of people utilizing it and obviously owners needing to pay the mortgage. So they have to convert the Airbnbs into uh, normal long-term rentals. Haven't seen any major conversions back, um, but I'm kind of hearing just on the sidelines that that's starting to trickle back in. How that's going to all transpire, who knows? Uh, there is going to be a space for that. And, and obviously it's a great business model. And ideally, yes, you know, especially in these high prices, this is kind of technically the only way that you can kind of get an ROI uh, with traditional long-term rental. It's going to be tougher. Okay. So you just mentioned some ROI. And I think one way that people are increasing their ROI for the rentals, just being more liberal with their pet restrictions. So David, I'll let you start first. How much more rental income can uh, landlords anticipate if they uh, do accommodate pets? It could go range between 10 and 20 percent more um, and especially if it's in a very desirable location there's no other uh, say uh, units that are allowing pets just for example condos most owners are really hesitant about pets and i think they have a misunderstanding about pets you have to look at the the pet owner if the pet owner is very responsible you're ideally going to have a very responsible uh, tenant and a pet so uh, these are the things that we normally try to assess out before we even, you know allow a pet Okay, for landlords, are there limitations as to how much of a pet damage deposit that they can collect? Maximum is half a month's rent. Got it. So you okay. can have two pets and it's the same amount. Sure. And Brian, um, how about on your side of the, the world there? Uh, on, on that note, I mean, I, it's, it's all about us educating the owners because I, I strongly push for allowing pets because I say one, it gets us that half a month's deposit. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, a two or five year old can do far more damage than a, a pet does, you know, depending on the, the pet owner. So I always encourage it. It gets you a bit, typically it gets you a better renter because they, they want to stay. They don't want to have to look for another place that, that allows for pets. So it gets you a, a more responsible tenant in, in the majority of cases. Um, and again, for us, we get, you know, anywhere from a hundred to $200 uh, extra a month on a rental. So it equals out to 10 to 20%, just like David said, sort of thing for us. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I didn't think about it that way where you can get a, you know, less turnover with a, with a pet owner. Yeah. 
Yeah, all so right, and go out there and find uh, pet friendly rentals. It, it's really tough, and I hear that all the time from tenants uh, who are looking. So it's a it's a good thing if you want to position yourself, especially if you have a property that can be conducive to a pet, because that's going to make it um, a lot more desirable, and you can actually command a higher price. Got it. All right, and now we'll switch over to some of the historical hot temperature that we've been having. David, I'll start with you first. Did you experience anything with your tenants, you know, maybe leaving because of, they didn't have AC in their units? Uh, what did you experience um, on this side? Mainly all the uh, requests for my air conditioning units not working. I need to get fixed and, and then calling out to uh, get a mechanical or uh, AC company and getting told it's going to be two weeks out because there's nothing we can do. We're fully booked. That's the challenge. And with new tenants, are they asking, are they, are you getting a lot more requests than you typically get for people requesting units with AC? Yeah, there's no doubt. Um, climate changes here. Um, Vancouver used to never be a, uh, an issue to have AC, but now it's almost uh, a sec every second person would ask you, do you have AC? And some of these new buildings don't have AC. So um, it's ideal if you can get AC. And if you don't, um, you might want to consider investing into a system. Great. And what are you experiencing on that side of uh, British Columbia, Brian? Yeah, believe it or not, it's not really an, much of an issue here except for the maintenance end of things because nine out of 10 people have ACs here and always have. So um, I can, I have under a handful of properties for me that don't even have ACs, but it's not typically an issue for me except for the maintenance end of things when it does get record high temperatures like this. So what we've been experiencing is lots of completions of new condo residential towers. Many of these completions are owned by investors and these investors are in turn putting these units into the rental pool. So do you think this new inventory will affect rental rates in your region? And I'll start with Brian. Not immediately. I mean, our inventory levels are so low, it's gonna take them years to catch up as far as I'm concerned. Um, so no, I think we're just going to be on a steady, steady, you know, we're going to be steady on, on our numbers right now because I think they're overinflated right now. So this inventory is just going to bring them down a bit to reality, which is people aren't going to be dropping their prices anytime soon. It's just going to stay stable as far as I'm concerned. But again, I'm, I'm not a forecaster, so I'm just guessing. Great. David, what's your, what's your interpretation on this? For every new building that's uh, coming up, uh, we tend to see a massive uh, listing surge. Um, so for example, we have a, a new building out here at Metro Town at uh, Station Square. Um, it seems like the first couple months, once the building gets fully occupied or the, the occupancy is uh, taken over by the owner, they're listing the property. Say we can have up to 30% of the building being listed. That's going to put a flood into the market. You're going to see prices at a, a very desirable rate because owners want to have a tenant quickly as possible. Uh, what happens after that, uh, the inventory gets absorbed, the prices start to stabilize and they go back up a little bit. Um, and I'll give you a prime example. I have a third floor, two bedroom, two bath, 840 square foot unit, brand new, uh, not a great view. It has a decent uh, uh, entryway because it overlooks into a nice courtyard. We have other units uh, and we're asking 25 more pet friendly. And so we have uh, other units in the 20th floor, 18th floor, even 26th floor. They're asking 24, maybe 26. And they're both similar size. View wise, obviously you're higher up. So those technically go first uh, because you get all the desirable um, price points and also the view. Uh, I've seen some at 23 and they go, right? For us, we have 25, it's gonna take a little longer. And so what is, has happened is as the product gets absorbed, more rentals are coming off the market, there's less to choose. And you're gonna see people who really wanna be in the building, they're willing to pay. So that's that's what's happening in, in the early stages of a new building. Uh, in terms of inventory, there's all, obviously there's more coming on. Um, I, I'm seeing um, properties are you know being retrofitted to become more higher density. And we're talking about single family homes. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier. So that's increasing. Um, you know, op, op, options in terms of rental question is, is it the right fit? And so these are the challenges. Okay. You just mentioned David, uh, you know, larger, larger operations like single family homes and things like that. So what we're seeing, you were seeing articles about right now are institutional investors getting into large scale, single family rental operations. We're seeing that in Ontario right now, where they're investing about a billion dollars in acquiring single family homes adding a rental suite and creating two sources of income from the one property. 
So if this came to BC, how do you think this will impact our rental market as a whole and rental rates? I think it's already happening uh, in small pockets. We're having, um, I, I just went to a property just yesterday. Um, the investors purchased an old building and what they're gonna do is they're gonna plan out uh, development on that property. They're gonna probably put three pieces of three rental properties on there, usually a duplex and a laneway. Uh, I've seen another property just adjacent to another one that similar uh, de uh, design, what they purchased. And they are doing these duplexes with laneways. And so it's kind of happening. It, institutional wise, it hasn't happened yet, but I'm seeing small pockets happening and they're, that's the only way they're gonna try and justify uh, a positive cash flow, if you can say that. I don't know the numbers per se after when they finish building and, and what they're gonna generate, but I can see from the design way that you're gonna be paying a premium for these properties because they're nicely built, they're probably gonna be energy efficient and they're gonna have a nice appeal and they're in the right neighborhood. Got it. Okay, Brian, any insight on that? Yeah, I just I don't think I think there's years away from coming to Kelowna. The, the, those kind of companies they hit the big metropolitan cities first, and you know they see how it works out, and then you know as a training ground kind of thing. Um, so I mean, I, I would welcome it. I should say I'd welcome the inventory. So right now is up here to to, mm -hmm. to ease up these unrealistic pricing. But again, you know, I think I, I know the article you're referring to, and I mean they tend to look at the people they're interviewing are anti-poverty groups. So they tend to look at it in a negative way. That's such a bad thing that big bad wolves coming in to take over everything and jack up the prices. I don't really see it that way, but again, that's just my uneducated guess. We've spoke about the different experiences that property managers are experiencing in the greater Vancouver and Okanagan regions. Uh, we got a good pulse on the rental markets in both sides. So to give us a better understanding about the contrast and the difference in the rental rates, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to describe a type of property and I'll have both of you answer a range in those rental rates. And I'll start with David and then Brian can follow afterwards. So the first kind of property is a one bedroom condo located in downtown. It's 500 square feet. It's about 10 years old and it comes with one parking stall. David. Uh, 1900 to 2100. Got it. How about you, Brian? We don't see a whole lot of the micro suites. They just started coming in here in the last couple of years. So um, I personally don't even have any of those, but um, you're anywhere from 1400 to two grand up here for something like that. Again, we're, we're always based on how close you are to the beach sort of thing. So that kind of dictates the pricing around here for something like that. Hmm. It's interesting you call it a micro suite because we're starting to see 500 square foot, two bedrooms these days. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully not too, too soon for us. <laughs> So the next type of property is a two bedroom, two bath condo, also in downtown. You're about 10 years old as well, 900 square feet. You got a small balcony and you have one parking stall. David, start with you. 2850 to 3100. Sorry, could you say that again? 2850 to 3100 per month. So, so 2850 to 3100. And Brian, what is it like out there? We're, we're depending on the area, you're about 1800 to 2500 for the average one. If you get into the towers, you're, you know, you have views of the lake and downtown, you're up to 3500. Wow. Yeah. All right. The next one is a three bedroom townhouse. You're within 15 minutes of the downtown core. You're on two floors. You have about a 200 square foot outdoor patio. You have a parking stall and the home is 15 years old. So we'll start with David. I have one almost identical with the exception as two parking stalls, which is a premium. Uh, we're getting 4,900 on that. And that's in the downtown core. So we're not even having to commute 15 minutes, maybe five minutes. Wow. Brian. 25 to 3,200 for us. All right. And lastly, we'll end with a detached home. All right. So you're within 20 minutes of the downtown core. You're built in the 1950s. You were updated in 2010. You have two suites. So upstairs you have a three bedroom, one and a half bath. And downstairs you have a two bedroom and one bathroom. Uh, you have decent yard space. How much rent would you get separately and collectively? Let's go with David. I actually have two I can probably share. One on the east side of Vancouver, one on the west side, closer to UBC, maybe 10 or 15 minutes drive. 
uh, currently just have acquired a new property with my client here. We're renting the upstairs three bedroom, two bath for $3,000. And I think it's about uh, 1,400 square feet. Has a balcony, front yard, uh, a little bit of a backyard and a driveway. There's no garage. Uh, so that's 3000 downstairs. We're right now renovating it and we're going to be asking uh, 2000 for two bedroom and one bath with a uh, living space and uh, even added to with a dishwasher. And one additional here, because we're cognizant of COVID, we have to have two laundry rooms. So each uh, tenant will not have to share, uh, which is uh, a huge bonus in this one. Um, the one in East Vancouver, which is closer to to the Nile and um, 22nd where the SkyTrain station is. We have right now a three bedroom, two, one and a half bath, renovated upstairs and downstairs home. Uh, we're renting it for 2,800. Downstairs is two bedroom, one bathroom, uh, a little slightly smaller. Uh, we're looking at uh, 1750 and we have front and backyard and um, we have uh, parking in the back. Brian, I'll, I'll repeat it again. It's a detached home within 20 minutes of downtown built 1950s, updated in the 2010s, and you have two separate suites, three bedrooms up with one and a half baths, and you have two bedrooms down with one bath. You have decent yard space. So how much rent would you get separately and collectively? Well, it's gonna to be tough to find something built in the 1950s, first of all here. So I'm gonna to have to update you to about 1980s, 70s, 80s. We have lots of three bedroom up, two bedroom walkouts like that. Um, and just generically, you're. 1800 to 3200 for the up for a three bedroom and downstairs would be anywhere from 16 to 2200 for a two bedroom downstairs. We always have separate laundry because it's very frowned upon having to share laundry. Um, and if these places have to have some kind of shared yard space in the backyard typically, and I just have everyone basically share the landscaping duties sort of thing on that. But uh, those places are gobbled up with people's with pets instantly. So that's okay. always a good yeah. to look for, for sure. And you mentioned that's this quite a big spread, 1800 to 3200 for upstairs. Can you describe what something that would be 1800 would be like and something that 3200 would be like? Um, yeah, just basically your, your size of room, just the, the space in essence. Um, again, I, I've got some places that, you know, we're working off of 1500, you know, 1500 square feet to, you know, 2500 square feet upstairs, that that would be, you know, the higher end. Um, but then there's tiny ones that, you know, have 800 to 1000 sort of thing. So it, it all depends on your space in essence. So this concludes our interview with David K. Wong with McDonald Commercial in Vancouver, and Brian Saul with Real Property Management located out in the Okanagan. How do we get a hold of you guys? Start off with David. You can find me on Craigslist, Zumper, PadMapper, or even do a Google search. I'm pretty transparent. Um, you can also find me on the McDonald Commercial PM website. Great. And Brian, if someone wanted to get a hold of you for your services, uh, what's the best way to get a hold of you? You bet. Uh, we're, we're, we have 300 branches throughout North America. So you have to look up Real Property Management Pinnacle. Uh, that gets you directly to me. I'm under www.rpmpinnacle.ca or you can reach me directly at 250-878-1901. Love to hear from you. All right. Thanks so much, both of you. Thanks so much for your time and uh, we'll see you guys next time. All right, guys. Take care. Thanks for having awesome. me. Yeah, no problem. Thanks so much.